brief introduction. I'm Matt Calabrese. Uh, I am a software engineer at Google. I work with Titus on the AbSale team. I've been there about four or five years. I've been programming in C++ for 15 years. I've been coming to this conference for 12 years. Uh, I'm a member of the Boost, uh, the Boost Steering Committee, and I'm a uh, member of the C++ Standards Committee. Uh, you may know me as CPP Sage on Twitter, where I uh, tend to evangelize C++ and also criticize C++ quite a bit. <laughs> so before we get started, I want to talk a little bit about my philosophy when it comes to runtime polymorphism in C++. And I think once you understand this, you kind of get a better sense of why I care so much about the types of things that I'm doing in this library. So basically, my philosophy is that in the presence of variance and type erasure, they are basically always I say generally superior, but I will say I will say pretty much always superior to inheritance and virtual functions. <laughs> uh, the main advantages are that when you create your type, you don't have to even know that you are working on it. You're going to be working on it in a uh, in a polymorphic setting. You can just work on the type, think about its invariance, and that's it. Um, it's totally non-intrusive. So at the time that you want to add polymorphic behavior to it. Uh, you don't have to go back and modify your original types. You could even use variance and type erasure with types that aren't yours. For instance, uh, std function does this all the time. Uh, you don't have to modify a function object in order to put it into a std function. And same thing with std variant. You don't have to modify your types in order to put them into a std variant. It just works with any type right out of the box. Titus. On the other hand, once you do type erasure, then you lose track of where things are being used. Can't index through function. All right, sure, <laughs> sure, okay. Um, the other thing I like about them is that they give you value semantics by default. If you're using an inheritance hierarchy and you are storing a target via a pointer because it's pointing to some kind of child of a base class, it's generally much more difficult to get proper value semantics out of it. There's a standard library proposal called Polymorphic Value with help that helps with this, which basically allows you to create something like a unique pointer except it has proper value semantics. And when you pass it around, it clones the object. And so that helps a little bit there. And finally, a big thing that working with variance gets you that working with inheritance does not get you is that you get efficient multi-method support. So if you're working with an inheritance hierarchy and, for instance, you're in sh you are representing like a physics simulation and uh, maybe you have a base class for things that are collidable, if you want to implement a very like a polymorphic form of a collision function where you can collide like squares on one side and circles on another, or triangles and circles, or any combination. Uh, you can't easily do that with just a single hierarchy and virtual functions. You end up having to do multiple dispatch. However, with things like variants, you actually get direct multi-method support right out of the box, and it's <coughs> fully efficient, and you don't need to do anything in order to uh, to make that happen. So. Even though I, I very strongly believe that in the presence of some types and type erasure, you should pretty much always use it instead of inheritance. Um, I think there are some very practical reasons why experts and non-experts don't use them all the time in practice. And to start with, a variant is a very new concept to most people. Uh, in, in, in C++ 17, we added variant. But I mean, it it's, it's, uh, has very few uh, facilities for actually dealing with it. We, we include std visit, which is kind of a cumbersome higher order function in order to extract out the currently active alternative inside of a variant. But we don't have uh, language level facilities like pattern matching, which would make things so much easier. So yeah, basically my conclusion is that even though it's often better than inheritance, Variants are too foreign to most people, and they have a very steep learning curve because of these cumbersome facilities that we currently have in the language. So I basically aim to make variants much more usable. Uh, so the library that I'm going to be presenting uh, in this talk is actually based on a standard library proposal that I submitted, uh, I think, two years ago now, called a single generalization of student invokes that apply and stood visit. And the idea of that paper is it creates a generalization of how we invoke functions in the language. Specifically, it allows us to invoke functions in a way that lets us expand out alg algebraic data types, being product types, such as tuples, and some types, uh, such as variants, any point in an argument list. 
Uh, so anyway, I presented that paper. Uh, I, I wasn't actually looking to have it go into the language at that point. I was mostly just trying to get some feedback so that way I can work on the library, get it into Boost, and then come back with it later. And I've since kind of decided that I'm going to come back with it eventually as a language level proposal instead of a library level proposal. And if you want to try it out today or during the talk, uh, it's up on GitHub. It's at github.com slash my name slash Argo. Uh, it's a header only library. The entire thing is all templates. So it's, it's really easy to just pick up and start using. And yeah, disclaimer, I do this all in my, my own spare time. And so yeah, the, the, the testing is, is a little bit spotty at points. So before we get going, I'm going to talk a little bit about alg algebraic data types in C++. So we have product types in C++. And when I say product type, I basically mean things like structs, tuples, and std arrays. And we have very limited facilities for actually unpacking these product types in C++. Uh, the main facility that we have that came about in C++17 was std apply. And what std apply lets you do is take an existing tuple and some kind of function object, and you could expand out all of the tuples elements and pass them as arguments to that function. So it's a sort of a complicated higher order function. And the function object that you pass must completely consume all of the elements of the tuple. So does anybody not understand the, the slide, this apply, how this apply works? Can I move on? OK. So the other facility we have in C17 is structured bindings. And rather than at a call site, it lets you take product types and decompose them down into their constituents. It allows you to assign names to each of the individual components. So here, we have a function that returns a std tuple of int, float, and char. And we have a nice way of, of calling that function. And then instead of getting the result as a single tuple that we have to reference the elements with like get 0, get 1, get 2, we actually create these convenient little aliases called a, b, and c. But when looking at other languages, very often when they have tuple support, you can just expand out a tuple in an argument list. Why can't we do this in C++? And I think that's, <laughs> I can't stress that enough. Why did we end up with this? We've had tuples, we've had tuples in the language since C++11. When really, this syntax shouldn't be that hard to get. Now, hypothetically, we know that C++ is kind of powerful. I wonder if there's some way that we can do something like this. We can't overload dot, dot, dot. We can't, we can't overload asterisk. Is there some way we can make that work? I don't know. So moving on to some types. In C++, we have std variant, std optional. We have a proposal for std expected. Uh, these top two ones were introduced in C++ 17. I think most people know they are. And the facility that we have for interacting with variants in C++ is std visit. And it's, it's actually pretty similar to, um, to std apply. But uh, before I show an example of that, let's start by making an instance of a variant. In this case, we have a variant of a circle and a square, and we're calling it a shape. And we're going to make some kind of overload set, because we want to be able to draw uh, whatever our shape is. So to start, we're going to make an overload that allows us to draw a square, an overload that allows us to draw a circle. And with that, and along with visit, we're able to write an algorithm that can operate over you know, a sequence of shapes and then draw each shape. And if a, given, uh, if a given shape inside of our container happens to be a circle, then this call will appropriately dispatch to the circle. And, it, and if a given shape inside of our container happens to be a square, it'll dispatch appropriately to the square. So does everybody follow this? So could variant visitation be better? Uh, arguably, well, unarguably, it certainly can be. Plenty of languages offer pattern matching. And the key thing I want to point out is the Clay programming language, which, is, uh, which maybe a lot of people haven't heard of, even goes a step further. And it provides an operator called the dispatch operator. Sorry, has anybody heard of the Clay programming language? 
So, <laughs> so the clay programming language was started by this guy. Um, I think his name is KS Sririm. And um, it's a statically typed language. Uh, people who've worked on the clay language include, I think his name is Joe Groff, somebody who works on, on the Swift team right now. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's mostly kind of like a toy language, but it's, it's pretty powerful. And again, it's perfectly statically typed. One of the things it has is it has native support for variant types. And this example here is basically exactly the same thing as the previous example, except it's in a different language. So you create a variant called shape. This is you know, basically like a type. Uh, and it can contain either a circle or a square, just like our std variant. And here's how we define an overload set. So this basically just says that our overload set is unary, and it always takes some type parameter s. And s must always satisfy this predicate. And that predicate means that it must be one of the constituent alternative types that are in the shape. So in other words, whatever overload you write, it must be either a circle or a square overload. So it kind of constrains things. These are sort of like concept constraints. Uh, and then just like in the previous example, there's a simple little algorithm that iterates over a vector of shapes, and we draw each element. And the key thing I want to stress here is, look at how easy this is. We have a variant, and all we have to do to, to draw the, the corresponding underlying element is use this single, little, uh, this single little operator. And it just passes along the active alternative. And if we go back and compare that to what we were doing here, why would anybody <laughs> prefer this over this. And the, the key thing to keep in mind here is this is like, it's a totally statically typed language, just like C++. And it's possible to do this. So if you thought that, oh, maybe this isn't even like a feasible thing, we could totally do this in the language. So yeah, so wouldn't it be nice if this just worked? So before going further, I just want to try to figure out why exactly we are in the state that we are in C++. Why do other languages have such better support for algebraic, algebraic data types? And why do we fail so poorly? So to start, these other languages generally have built-in support for their algebraic data types. They have built-in tuple types. They have built-in variant types. Although I would argue that that's not even the real reason why they do, why they do better here. The real reason is that they have facilities for generating argument lists at the call site. And this is very distinct from the need to have an underlying you know, language level tuple type or a language level variant type. The key thing is that they have these operators. Like Python, if you have an iterable, if you just use asterisk, it generates an argument list from all of the, all of the, the underlying elements. And similarly in Clay, as we saw, you can do the same exact thing with a variant. Passes along the alternative. These are just kind of abstractions for saying, I have this one expression, and I want to expand that single expression out to separate arguments. So you can hypothetically provide these facilities in a language like C++, even if you do not have um, built-in support for algebraic data types. Uh, the other problem is just simply community culture. Uh, functional communities and you know, these toy languages like Clay just tend to have people involved who are much more into type theory, category theory, and just higher level concepts in general. Uh, C++ tends to be sort of a uh, pragmatic language. And a lot of the people who even participate in the committee are not necessarily people who are into type theory, into category theory. And so that, you can kind of see that reflected in, in how the language design has gone. Not that we don't do great things. We still do great things. But there's sort of a cultural problem there, I think. So how can we actually improve working with tuples and variants in C++? Well, as I said, we could add more. Uh, we could add better language support. There have been proposals to actually add pattern matching uh, and language level variants that uh, David Sengel wrote. Michael Park, who's also in this room, is is also working on a pattern matching paper. I don't know when that's coming, but hopefully soon. And hypothetically, we could always just adopt a clay-like dispatch operator, although nothing's been proposed. Alternatively, or in conjunction with that, we can also just improve our library support. So. Stood visit isn't great, but the real problem is that it's the only facility that's there. There are other things that you can do with variants. There are higher level algorithms, higher level utilities that you can do that operate on variants that we just simply don't provide. And so 
I would argue that you know, we should start focusing our efforts on library before we even get to the, the language level support. And that's kind of what I've been doing with this library, Argo. Uh, and ideally, I'm just going to propose it for Boost and then maybe eventually bring it to the Standards Committee again. But take those ideas and maybe turn them into the language features. So as I said, the problem with std visit isn't so much that it's incapable. I mean, there is some kind of syntactical problem there, and it's, it's kind of superficial. But it also, there are other facilities that we could use. And so what exactly can't we do with a std visit? So observation. Uh, a std variant in C++17, it's, it's templated over uh, a variadic pack of types called t. And we could actually have duplicate types in a variant. When you use a std visit, it forwards along a reference to the currently active alternative. So if you have a std variant of like an int, float, and a char, and it happens to be in the int state, you'll get back a reference to the int. If it's in the char state, you get back a reference to the char. If it's in the whatever I said float state, you'll get back a reference to that. But the problem is, what happens if you have duplicate types? What happens if you have an int, a float, and an int in it? Well, when you do a visit operation, you actually lose a bit of information. You might get back a reference to an int, but you lose, the, you lose whether you were at index 0 or if you were at index 2. And these can have totally different semantic meaning. And if that's not really clear, uh, I'll go into that in later slides and show a practical example of why this fails. And you might think, oh yeah, but it has the dot index, the dot index function, which gives me back a runtime value. Well, it turns out that that's not enough. So using variants in practice, um, imagine you have uh, a set of ranges, like you're implementing something like the ranges TS. And you want to create a function that logically concatenates a bunch of ranges together which, uh, without copying them into their own container. So you get like a concatenated view of a whole bunch of different ranges. Uh, an example of that here, just imagine we have some range type 1, range 2, and Here's the operation I'm talking about, this concatenate. What we want this to do is return a combined view of these ranges, so you can treat it as one range overall. And then we want to be able to run algorithms on it as if it was a single range. So it's kind of a simple concept. Does everybody understand the concept here? So you assume range 1 and range 2 are heterogeneous or homogeneous? You, you mean, are they different types? Yeah. Or, so, they, so the question was, are, these, are range 1 and range 2 different types. And so I was kind of trying to be sneaky about that. I, didn't, I specifically didn't say that. They may be the same type, and they may be different types. But either way, if they have the same underlying value type, you should be able to get a, a joint view of them. So that was a, a very good observation. <laughs> so let's start trying to implement the return type of this concatenate function. And again, this is variadic, but I'm only calling it with two here. So our example here is variadic. Uh, the return type of concat, we can think about it as just containing a tuple of all of the different subranges. And then we have some kind of iterator type. I'm leaving out most of the other details because these are the things I want to focus on. Yep. Are you restricting your argument to finite ranges? Uh, oh, the question was, am I restricting this to finite ranges? And I hadn't really thought about it, but yes. This is, let's pretend that these are finite ranges. These are very similar to just like, an iterator, iterator pair, or something along those lines. What was the last one? <laughs> <laughs> OK. So we have this iterator type. Let's actually implement this iterator type. Let's see how far we can get. So it's just like its, it's parent, the, the thing that it's iterating over. Uh, it's variadic over all the different subranges. And what you'll immediately see here is we're going to use a variant to represent uh, some part of our state of our iterator. And if it's not clear why we need a variant here, if you think about it, we have you know, n different ranges side by side. And we're trying to implement an iterator that goes over all of them. Mm -hmm. So at, if, at any given point, you're going to be either in this range, or this range, or this range, which means that at any given point, you're probably going to be containing an iterator from this range, or an iterator from this range, or an iterator from this range. And so that's exactly what making a std variant of all the iterator types gets you. Uh, is anybody lost on that? Or, OK. OK. So now that we have our state, uh, let's try to implement one of the easier operators. So we'll do the, the pre-increment operator. 
And uh, we're going to start out. We're maybe not entirely sure how this is going to work, but we know that we have to access the, the, the underlying iterator that we're, that we're incrementing here. So we know that it's going to be some kind of like a visit-like operation. We're going to forward along the implementation to some impl, and we're going to visit this. And so hopefully that gets us back a reference to one of these iterators. And here's our attempt at implementing increment impl. Uh, this is just a lambda. It captures a pointer to the encapsulating class. And this should be a reference to, if we're in the, if we're in the first range, it'll be a reference to the first range's iterator type, second range, reference to the second iterator type. And all we want to do to start is just simply increment that iterator. Uh, can anybody tell me like, what I have to do after that? Or am I done? Yeah, exactly. So we have to check, are we at the end of whatever subrange we're in? And if so, we have to advance to the next range, the beginning of the next range. So can anybody think of how you might do that? The comment from Marshall was he would read up Matt Ostern's paper on segmented iterators. <laughs> ben? You return, uh, you return whether or not you're at the end. If you're at the end, you would just go to the next variant. You would assign the variant to the next range to begin it. Right. So, so how would you actually implement that, though? So, how do we, so do we know which, which alternative we are in right now? Mm -hmm. So the comment from Vittorio was, it would be nice if we had a compile time index telling us which alternative we were actually at. And, and that's precisely right. At, at this moment, we have not enough information to know. We don't even know how to check if we're at the end of the first range, because we don't know, you know which range we're in. It's like You can think, if all of these were different types, then you could maybe uh, you know, do like a find operation and say, OK, which index am I at? And when I say a find, I mean like a compile time find and get back an index. But because there can be duplicates, that's not even enough. So really, what we want is some equivalent of visit that gives us compile time information corresponding to exactly the index that we are, that we are at in the variant. But we don't have it. So yeah, summary of the problem. Std visit forwards a reference to the active alternative, but it doesn't tell us the index of that alternative. It loses information. Even though we, ha we can still call dot index on the variant, that's just a runtime value. We can't index a tuple with that. So I guess the solution is you have a second collection of variants that are the end iterators. So you can do a binary visit with, I've got the ends to see am I at the end of the same thing that I'm in. So Alistair's comment is you could potentially do it by having two variants instead of one variant, right? In, is the that, in the visit. And doing a binary visit. I think you are right. Uh, no. Uh, you still have one more problem. What if the range is repeated? If, both of, if you're repeating the same range twice, right? So what you need to do in this case is actually when you start the right later, you need to keep an index of which one you are in currently. Oh, yes, that is right. You still need to, yeah, you still need to know that. So that even that is not enough, right? Yes, you could, you could check every single one and see if it's the end. I think we actually changed it so you can't do that comparison anymore. But I'm, I may be mistaken. But, but you're still running into the same problem again. If you're repeating data, you have to keep an index. So yeah. well, <laughs> well, we could keep trying to figure out other alternatives. But it turns out there's actually a much easier way than trying to come up with some hand-rolled thing at the call site here if we just had an additional facility. Instead of visit, we want a visit that gives us back an index. So Argo call. So, and actually, before I, before I go into this, somebody, somebody came up to me before this talk, and they said, why is this library called Argit? What is Argit? <laughs> and so it, 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 I realize now, Ar so Argo is a term that it, it, it basically means like a secret language of, like a, you know, of some kind of group. And uh, so the reason why I chose that is a lot of this library sort of feels like language level extensions. And when you see code written in it, it almost looks like you're writing a different language. And so I thought it was a very like, appealing name to use for this. It's, it's, it's uh, very descriptive. And also, it has arg in the name. And I, this is all about manipulating argument lists. So it's kind of funny. So anyway, the, 
the, the sort of core of this library is built on this single al algorithm called call. And as the subtitle says, it's all about taking argument lists that have placeholders in them and expanding out those placeholders into larger or smaller sets of arguments. Um, uh, but before I talk about exactly how Argo works, I'm going to talk about what is std invoke. So std invoke is basically the dumbest higher order function you could think of. Um, so you, it takes a function object and a series of arguments, and it basically does the same thing as just calling the function with those arguments. It does a little bit more than that. It's, it's capable of taking pointers to members and pointers to member functions and treating those as though, as though they were function objects. So there's a little bit of special casing there. But at a high level, it really is, in some sense, the dumbest higher order function. It just says, call this function. And so you know, here's an example of how you might use it. Imagine you have some function object called print, takes in a stream and some arguments. I left out the implementation, but you could imagine it's just you know, you know, using the, the streaming operator on the stream and outputting each argument in succession. And so you can call it easily by just writing print std cout123, but the equivalent with invoke would be that. So what is Argo call? So Argo call is exactly the same thing as invoke, except it is aware of an additional concept of a symbolic argument list placeholder. And if that's confusing, I'll show you an example of that in a second. But for now, you can think of it exactly as just did invoke. So looking at this is exactly the same example we had on the previous slide, except instead of std invoke, I'm replacing it with, with call. So if you don't have any of these symbolic argument list placeholders, it's just the dumbest you know, higher order function. It just calls your function that you pass it. So without the placeholders, it's not very useful. So let's talk about one of the, the first more interesting types of placeholders that you can use. And this one's called provunpack. And so all of the placeholders that I have in this library are nested in this little namespace prov. And that just stands for argument provider, which I'll talk about what that means later. Uh, but all you need to know is if you call prov unpack and you give it a tuple, the result of that function is a placeholder that tells the call algorithm, hey, instead of passing this tuple along as normal, expand out all of its arguments, expand out all of its elements as separate arguments. So here's an example. If you have a tuple and you invoke call, and you give it your function object, you pass in you know, std c out, which is not one of these placeholders, but then you pass prob unpack tup. What that effectively does is it expands out the int, the float, and char as separate arguments and passes along to print. Does everybody understand what's going on there? <laughs> OK. And so just for some terminology, I call this an argument provider. So the return type of prov unpack is one of these placeholders, and I refer to it as an argument provider. This is a concept that's fully fleshed out in the library. Um, if you were here last year, I went into much more detail about exactly the requirements, like all of the associated functions, associative types of the argument provider concept. But I'm going to skip over that for now. Uh, if you're interested, you should watch last year's talk. It goes into much more detail. Um, but so what exactly is call doing? As I said, it'll march through each and every argument. For everything that's not an argument provider, which this isn't, it will, it will just perfect forward it. And for everything that it is, it expands it out. So let's look at what an equivalent would be using std apply. Now, it may not appear so, but these two lines are actually the same thing. And I think most people would agree that this is considerably better. <laughs> Does anybody disagree with that? <laughs> no. <laughs> so there what? Is a namespace in there, there is a nested namespace. However, I will say the nested namespace only has objects in it, has no functions. So I, I fibbed when I said that this was when this was a, um, a, uh, a function. It's actually a function object. I try to do as, as much as I can to keep things you know, as good as they can be, despite there being nested namespaces. And, and you said that um, as it's going through and resolving and unpack each of the um, supplied argument providers, so if I had like three of them that were that Precisely, were yeah. unfolding them and then folding them? Like not so, so yeah, so the comment was, 
I only have one provider here, but what happens if, you know, after this one, I put like an integer, but then I did another unpack of a different tuple. Will it work? And the answer is yes. So what if you have a tuple of providers? And then, oh, so the comment was, what if I have a tuple of providers, or maybe a tuple of tuples or something? Yeah, but Keep, so this will only unpack one level deep. Okay. However, there are ways to, go, to get what you want, assuming that's what you want or what you were trying to avoid. I don't know. But. <laughs> Well, if it, so, the, the the question was, I don't know why. There's actually there's actually use cases where this comes up, specifically if you're working with things like parser combinator libraries or something like that. What ends up happening is, you know, you 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 take a bunch of parsers and you say this parser followed by that parser followed that by that parser and maybe this parser or this parser. And you what you end up doing is you end up building these these kind of hierarchies of algebraic data types. And so if you do anything like that then these types of facilities end up, end up being like really important. And, and, and something to keep in mind is you don't even get necessarily get back tuples. Um, I mean, you, you, don't ne you don't get back necessarily structs. They're very often unnamed tuples, so you, you know. And then is that sort of like rep first search uh, like expansion, and can you control that? Can you... Uh, so the question was, can you, ex can you control that expansion? So yeah, there, there, there are very fine grain utilities for how you explore these algebraic data types in the library. But, but each one generally only goes one step deep. And uh, I'll show you when you want to you know, dive deeper how you can do that. But that, that'll be coming up later. So we showed prob unpack. Here's another one that's very useful. This one's called prob alternative of. And it does something like a std visit operation. So where if you wrote prob unpack with a tuple here, it expanded all the elements. What this logically does is a visit of exactly one of the arguments, this, this argument that you passed. And if you, if you were to expand out you know, multiple different variants by using prob alternative of variant 2, prob alternative of variant 3, you get the equivalent of a variadic visit operation, which we have with std visit. Except the nice thing about that is you can have all, you know, we can have this leading C out parameter. We could have other parameters in between. And you don't have to create some kind of specific lambda that only has arguments that correspond to the, you know, the, the alternatives of your variant types. You can just use your existing print function, and you don't need to go and make additional higher level functions just to make it so you can visit it. So again, like with std apply, I showed what it's like if you were to use std apply, or with, with unpack, I showed what it was like to use std apply. With alternative, with alternative of, here's what it looks like with visit. And again, it's kind of this verbose mess, right? It's a higher order function. You have to make a lambda that takes in just you know, one of these int floats or chars. And then inside the body of that, you call print, passing C out, and then the arg. And then here's the variant that you're unpacking. It's kind of convoluted. But I mean, it works, though. But I hope everybody agrees that just like with the unpack example, this is you know, more of a step in the, in, in the right direction. So I showed two examples, and these kind of seem like they do almost two entirely different things, right? Um, uh, Vittorio. They actually do the, the variadic visit thing. So you pre-process the visit arguments, and as an optimization, you do a single uh, So the question was, if I do have a bunch of these in a row, do I actually go and combine them all and do a single visit operation? And the answer is the library currently does not, but that is an optimization that I've considered. However, the way that I do the visitation, um, it's already actually a little bit more optimal than what current variant implementations do. Um, and I'm not sure how much I would gain by doing that, but it, but it would be an interesting uh, exploration. And so stringing to see out is kind of takes any type. Does, does print have to be a template here? Or can it, if I only provide the print function that takes an int, mm -hmm. and I know that the, that the var contains an int, so the, the, the question was, so here we know that print is like a function object that's templated. And so it could take an int to float or a char. But if the variant here were in, if I knew it was in the state of an int, and I passed it along here, and print only took ints, would that still compile? And the answer is no. Because, so basically what happens behind the scenes here, just like with std visit, is it has to do something like the moral equivalent of a switch statement that says, if it's in the zeroth state, Call print with you know the int. If it's in the oneth state, call it with flow. Otherwise, call it with char. Wouldn't it work in this case because all three types in that variant are convertible to int? 
<laughs> Alice there makes a, a very keen observation that it would still work just because of conversions, implicit conversions, which is correct, but you probably don't want to do that. <laughs> so what exactly can an argument provider represent? It seems like those two previous examples were kind of you know, different. One was unpacking a tuple that turned things into n arguments, and the other one was, was unpacking a variant, which is like a, a, a some type of possible argument list. And that's actually the unifying thing, is both of them, what they do is they correspond to a some type of possible argument lists to be passed along to the function object. So in the tuple case, it's just like you made a variant of one argument list. In the, in the alternative of case, it's like you made a variant with n different possibilities, and each one of those <laughs> represented argument lists only had one argument. So they're, they're basically the same thing. But we can make things even easier. So it would be really nice if we didn't even have to write call, right? What if we could just write print, std c out, and unpack tuple? Well, I provide this little adapter here called as call object. And what it does is, if you give it a function like print, it returns a function object that is exactly like print. It perfect forwards to print, except that it understands what argument providers are, and it expands them out just like if you were to use call. So for example, if we defined our print operation, instead of being a lambda directly, we passed it to as call object. And we had something like tuples and variants, then we could just call print, pass instead c out, forward it along as normal because it's not an argument provider. And we can unpack the tuple, and then we could do, you know, access the alternative of this variant. Everything works. And so now we don't even have higher order functions that are visible here. And I would argue that this is much easier to teach people or much easier to read. I, I have a much easier time reading this than the, you know, visit unpack nonsense, especially when you have two different things here. You'd have to have like nested lambdas, and it gets a mess pretty quickly. But again, wouldn't it be even nicer if we could just overload dot, dot, dot? And we're kind of getting back to this point. Why can't we just do this in the language? So I've introduced what I call the DWIW operator. Does anybody know what that acronym stands for? Do what I want. Do what I want. That's right. So the do what I want operator, AKA the expansion operator. Uh, it's an operator that I've overloaded in a nested namespace because it's sort of a dubious overload and I'm not fond of, uh, <laughs> I'm not fond of that. Um, so you have to opt in if you want to use it. And the operator that I overloaded was unary plus. So if you have a tuple and you want to expand it out and you have one of these magic functions like print, and you want to expand out the tuple, you just write plus two. And that will expand it out. And looking back, that's pretty close to just writing tup dot dot dot. Not quite, but it's pretty convenient. What if I just would like to give the second, like only like the two first argument of the tuple to the function? Is that possible? So the question was, what if I only want to give the first two elements of the tuple to the function? So not with the plus operator, and I don't provide, I don't think I provide anything that would make it really simple to do that, but you could make your own argument provider that would do something like that. And also if you have any other tuple facilities like in, in HANA or something, you could, you could potentially make some kind of a view that's smaller than that and then you know, expand that out. But yeah, there's nothing directly that will let you uh, expand out only the first two elements. Okay, and you could also do the same thing for variants. So the default provision for a variant is just the equivalent of a visit operation. And both of these work. Yep. Can you define control attributes or any concept So the question was, does this operator work only for STD types or any types that model this hypothetical concept? Uh, so the answer is it's, it's not really a hypothetical concept. The, the, the library itself does define a tuple-like concept, and it does define a, a variant-like concept. It also defines a union-like concept, which is less refined than that. And what I've done is I've modeled um, boost tuple and std tuple 
Uh, so both boost tuple and sid tuple work there. And you could also go ahead and model your own uh, tuple type, and it will work with the plus operator. You don't even have to overload it for your type. You just pull it in from here. Same thing for variant. Um, it works with boost variant and std variant. And I, I forget if I only do one or both of std optional and boost optional. But if you wanted to, you can think of an optional as though it is a variant of like a nil type and the, the, you know, the actual type. And that will work. It forwards around. Uh, I call it nil t, and uh, in the other case, it forwards along, you know, the underlying t. So sorry if I'm getting ahead, but yep. we also solve regular void. So the question was, I also did I also solve regular void? Um, I'm not sure what exactly you mean with the nil thing. If, if you know, like this call abstraction, mm -hmm. you can say if it converts to return void, I'm actually returning nil t, and if I work with type void, I'm actually converting. So the point, so the comment was, if I'm returning void, I can convert it to nil t. Not quite. So this does do regular void emulation. I call it, um, I call it void with a capital V, <laughs> and um, it corresponds to just like an empty void type. And it, in, inside the language, when you do like a bunch of concatenations, it does convert void to that uppercase void. But to be clear, that is no replacement for, <laughs> for regular void because it's it's still very cumbersome to use. But yeah, that is that is exactly the technique. Is um, it's able to detect if voids are there when you're doing certain kinds of invocations, and it replaces them out. The place that comes up is um, is if you remember compose that compose operator, you can compose things that have void return types, and it forwards along as void. Uh, I do not go deeper into detail on that in this talk, so we'll have to talk about it later. So. As I've shown, some things that work with plus, there are tuple-like types, there are variant-like types. But it also works with argument providers of things that work with plus. And if you don't understand the implications of this, I'll show you in the next slide. And also, users can opt in and, and do that. That kind of goes along with you can, you can either uh, just make your type a tuple-like or a variant-like, or you can model a concept called expandable. And in which case, you don't have to overload the operator yourself. It just automatically notices, oh, you model expandable then this plus operator is going to work. So argument providers of expandables. So that was this argument providers of things that work with plus. What that basically means is that you can use plus any number of times in a row as you want. And if you have a tuple of tuples or a tuple of variants, um, then using it twice will expand it out two levels deep. So it's, yeah, it's very convenient when dealing with nested algebraic data types. How do I deal with max munch? Yeah. Oh, you mean because their definition is sort of recursive? How does it keep yeah. going? So I actually have to explicitly handle that case. So it, it, it will automatically prevent against that. But it always does only go one, one level deep. Um, so yeah, so here's an example. You have a variant of tuples, uh, int and float, and the other tuples are char and double. So when you use, the pl when you use plus twice in a row, what it actually does is it'll give you back, you know, the elements of this. So in this case, it will always be called with either just an int and a float or just a char and a double. And if you notice here, this is two pluses in a row, which is actually the prefix plus, plus. increment operator. <laughs> so it's actually two operators that are overloaded here, but it still works. So you can space them out, or you can do it like that. I just do that for convenience. And you could have three in a row, four in a row, five in a row, however many levels deep your algebraic data types are. So. So now that we have kind of the basics, and Bryce? That's, that's, it's, that's too urinary. So <laughs> it is not. So the question was, this is two urinary pluses? And the answer is no. You could space them out and have them be two urinary pluses. But this is definitely the pre-increment operator. So I actually overload both of them. And they're, high, they're hidden away in that namespace. <laughs> so if you have four, is it? If you have four, you can do any combination. You know, I mean, you could do plus and then plus plus and then plus, and it'll all work. <laughs> so, how much of this actually requires C plus plus seventeen? Uh, can you can you do everything you've done so far with fourteen? So the question was, how much of this can you do with uh, require seventeen, and how much can you do with fourteen? I could backport a lot of it to fourteen. Uh, the C plus plus seventeen features that I take advantage of a bunch are like if const expert. Uh, I use like the nested namespace declar declaration stuff, but that's easy to port back. Uh, but really, the main thing is just I didn't bother trying to support C++ 14. 
uh, it may or may not be much of an effort to, to backport it. But, uh, the other things are, oh, it's, 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 so everything is const expert. So uh, I use lambdas in some places, so that's something that'll change. If you, if you backport it to 14, then some stuff will no longer be const expert. Right? So that might be a little harder to fix. So let's, uh, oh, I've got to speed up a bit. So let's move on to a, uh, a use case here. So we know kind of the basics of how things work. Uh, and let's try to go back and implement the range concatenation now that we have these, these, these facilities. So refresher, we have ranges. We want to concatenate them. We're trying to implement this. And here was our overall, um, our overall range type. It contains a tuple of all of our subranges. And we're trying to implement the iterator type here. And if you remember, we had a variant of all the iterator types. And this is about where we got. And we're trying to implement the increment operator of this iterator. So I provide an additional argument provider that I didn't mention before called index of. And what this does is you pass it a variant. And instead of giving you back a reference to the currently active alternative of the variant, it gives you back a std integral constant corresponding to the variant index. So if for example, you have a variant of three types. And notice there's duplicates here. And it happens to be in this state, the int state. When you call foo of prov with passing prov index of, what it will actually do is call foo with a std integral constant passing in two. And because this, this value is encoded in the type, then from inside of our overall increment operator, we can use it as a compile time constant. Right. So now we can proceed that we have this facility. So instead of doing a visit, we'll use call. And we'll, you know, we don't know exactly what we're going to do in the increment just yet. But we know that we're going to need this compile time index. So here's what the start of increment looks like. OK, so now this lambda takes in an auto index. And if you remember, this is always going to be a std integral constant. So we always have compile time information here of which index we are. And so we increment the corresponding alternative in our variant. So this is equivalent to with what we did with our visit. But now we know how to proceed, because we know exactly which uh, index value we have. And so I couldn't fit it all in one line, so I pushed it off into another function. Let's see what we do. So if you remember, the next thing we have to do is if we got to the end of one of the ranges, we have to change it to be the beginning of the next range. It's actually a little bit more subtle than that, because if the next range is an empty range, we actually have to go to the next range after that. So this is going to be a little bit more complicated, but still pretty simple. So here's what the implementation of that function looks like. I, if you remember, corresponds to the index in the variant of you know, the current iterator that we're at. Um, and we start by doing an if const expert. And this, if it's not clear why this is necessary, if we are all the way at the last um, at the, the last alternative in our variant, then we can't move on to the next uh, to the beginning of the next range because there is no next range. So in that case, it, it's going to be you know we're just going to be done, and this function body is going to be empty. So we need that check there. Otherwise, we recurse forever and we go off into ranges that don't exist. So. We have the index. We can now compare it inside the tuple to see if we're at the end of that corresponding range. So std get i of the underlying it that's a, you know, accessing the variant. And we're calling the end of the, of the uh, full range was the parent range that contains all of our subranges. And if we are at the end, then we're going to do an mplace operation in the variant and set it to the beginning of the range that appears later which is the i plus 1 range. Does, does everybody understand what's going on here? I'm sure that not many people use this form of in place, but it exists. Okay. And then finally, one last step. Again, if the next range happened to be an empty range, then we're going to have to move to the next range. So we kind of it's a pseudo recurse. I mean, it's a different instantiation. So we're kind of recursing. And then Alistair. Code. I'm trying to see how I get access to underlying IT from within advanced to non-empty range. Wait, can you repeat that? 
I don't see how I get access to underlying IT within advanced and on empty range. It's, uh, it's a member function. Yeah, so it's, it's not a Lambda without a capture. It's a, it's a, so it does have access. So yeah, the question was just how does it have access, and it's a member function, so it can, it can do that. Tony? What's the, what's the really new function? Is this really the new function? Con, of, of what? Of you don't have this function, you would just name it. Oh, so oh concatenate you mean? Or? Oh. Advanced to next. Oh, well, I, this is just an example. I don't have this in there. I mean, but this is just. Maybe advanced. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe work. advanced, that's a good, yeah. Because it does the if check. I apologize for poor naming. <laughs> so, and our range type's done. That's it. So, Eric and Casey can relax. We did everything. That's done. So, moving on. Applications to concurrency. So, this is where, if you came to our last year's talk, um, I hypothesized that we could maybe use this kind of facility to form continuations with then. And so I've done a little bit of work, and uh, I have some experimental progress here. So before we do that, let's talk about what kinds of concurrency facilities we have in C++ today. We have std async, and the intent of std async was that we can easily execute functions asynchronously. So in other words, you can do something like write std async, pass it in a function, and a bunch of arguments, and it'll give you back a future to the result, and it'll be you know, run in some other thread, maybe. Uh, but it turns out that the way we implemented std async, we sort of failed. So you don't get much control over um, your thread of execution. Um, the futures that are returned from async may block in their destructor. Uh, it's, it ended up kind of a mess. So for the past, I don't know how many years, Bryce and co. and everybody in SG1 or concurrency TS have been you know, trying to improve the state of, con of concurrency in C++. Um, and we, we're trying to, I don't know, are, are we getting rid of async or are we? I think the current, current term that people are bending about is async2. Async2, yeah. So basically async has to go. We, can't, we probably can't fix the one that we have. So yeah. there's one option of what to do with it. Mm -hmm. You might as well fix it. Um, <laughs> Price. Async is a poster child for standardizing something without an implementation. Yes. And I was even going to mention that. And, and so Marshall raised the point, async is a poster child for standardizing something that we did not have an implementation of. And it's true. And, that's, and if, sometimes people wonder, like, how does the standard get things in it that are just broken right out of the box? For instance, std function had um, allocator support that wasn't actually implementable. Um, and that was because it was added later. I mean, std function existed before, and it was existing practice in boost, but boost function did not have allocator support. So we kind of added it on last minute, and there was no implementation, and it turns out it wasn't actually a feasible thing to do. So stuff like this happens, and the, you know, the committee makes mistakes, but this is a really good example of it. We need to really start with uh, existing practice rather than just taking novel ideas and getting them into the standard because you don't know what comes up. So there are other problems with std future itself. Uh, in, in C++ 17, not counting the concurrency TS, uh, the only way to access the underlying value of a future is to call this dot get function, which is a blocking operation in the thread that you're in. So if you, your operation's running off in you know, some separate thread and you call get here, it's going to completely block until this is done so this thread's not going to make any progress. And then finally, you get back the answer. Um, but if anybody's worked with futures in other languages, or if they've worked with stlab futures, or boost futures, or concurrency TS futures, which probably nobody's ever worked with, uh, you, can, you can queue things up with dot then. And the idea of, of dot then is you hook in a continuation that is run whenever the, the future actually becomes ready. And it executes on some other thread than the one that you're on, or potentially on the one that you're on, depending on how you implement them. But, but we don't have that. So yeah, as I mentioned, there, there are futures with continuation support, just not std future. Specifically, there's boost future, boost shared future, std, uh, std la or st lab futures. And here's a quick example of how you would use something like that. This is using st lab future to queue up 
a dot then operation. This is, I'm moving from it because it can actually be a more, more efficient implementation if we move the future. Otherwise, it has to basically clone out the, the, the result. Uh, and what this effectively says is we're going to run on some separate executor. I haven't defined what an executor is, but this describes what thread of execution we want the thing to run on. And this arg right here corresponds to the eventual result of this future. And so once it becomes ready, it uses this executor to execute this in some foreign thread of execution. I realized that was kind of a convoluted explanation. Do I need to repeat that? Or is everybody already familiar with that anyway? OK, cool. So an observation here is that this sort of feels like the std apply or the std visit situation. Right? I mean, here it's a member function call, but you could hypothetically think that this was, you know, an argument that was over here, and we're passing along this function object, and we're basically unpacking the thing that's here, and then it goes into the call that's there. So, idea is there some way that we can take advantage of our argument provider concept that, and you know, using our print example, can we? expand out some future whenever it becomes ready and do so in a non-blocking manner. Does anybody have thoughts here? Um, you wouldn't be talking about it if the answer was no. <laughs> the answer was, or the Marshall said, I wouldn't be talking about it if the answer was no. And he's actually incorrect. The answer is no. <laughs> so it, as, as we've laid out the concept so far, we actually cannot implement it. And the reason why is these argument providers represent argument lists. And they have to immediately provide these argument lists. There's no way for it to attach a continuation. So we could implement this syntax, but effectively it would have to call that get. And the print would not be returning a future to the, to the thing. It's just the, the facilities that, are, that exist just can't represent that. But even though it can't represent it, it seems like there might be some way we can create some kind of algorithm that can still use this syntax. So yeah, what went wrong? So argument providers must directly produce the arguments to the function. Uh, if you attended last year's talk, you'd understand why this is the case. Um, so the only way we could implement it is by blocking. But we don't want to do that. The result would not be a future. So introducing Argo async call. So the purpose of Argo async call. It should be a well-behaved replacement for std async. In addition to that, it should also have similar semantics to um, uh, Argo call. But it also should take in an executor. It should also return a future. And it should support some way that we can expand out a future only once it's ready. But before we start showing how we can implement that, let's talk about a slightly simpler function that I call async forgetful call. So the idea of async forgetful call is it performs an async operation like std async, only it doesn't return a future. It's a fire and forget. It has fire and forget semantics, which normally is, is you know, bad news. But the thing to keep in mind is when you're providing an executor, it's safe to fire and forget if you know where that thing is executing. And using this, if we have promises and we have um, or we have um, future packaging facilities like an ST lab, we can actually build async call from this lower level primitive. May not be perfectly efficient, but we can actually do that. And so here's an example usage of async forgetful call. So it takes in an executor. Again, I haven't explained exactly what an executor is in this context. Um, and we're passing along print. You probably would not be you know, printing in practice. This isn't a great way to do asynchronous IO or anything. Um, but we know it exists. Um, and then here, we're moving in some stream that we want to print to. And then we're passing along some variables. We're not expanding any futures here. This is strictly just doing an asynchronous call. And, and this all works. So let's talk about what an executor is in this previous example. So this EXEC. So an executor controls where and how an invocable is run. Uh, Bryce and many other people in the standards committee have been working on formalizing what the concepts are behind uh, executors. 
the executors that are implemented in this library, I lifted on my own from the types of things that I needed to get done. So they, they're kind of separate from, from all of that effort, but hopefully they'll, they'll end up being compatible. They're much more similar to the executors of STLab, and they're actually an extremely simple concept. They're basically just some kind of type that has an associated function that takes in another function object, and all it does is it executes it in some you know, implementation-specific thread of execution. And so that's it. It has one associated function, and it's very simple. And that function returns void. The, the result is just totally ignored. So you usually don't use executors directly, but to show an example of that one single associated function that uh, is provided is I have this nested namespace, sorry, executor traits. <laughs> and uh, there's an execute function. And you give it some model of your executor concept. And then you pass it in some null or invocable. This function returns void. And all it does is this controls what thread of execution this is executed on, and it'll execute it. Very simple. So conk when ready. So the whole goal of this, or one of the goals at the start, was we wanted to be able to use this async call function not only to pass in just you know, values that didn't come from futures, but we also wanted some way to expand out a future once it was ready. And so in this async call world, we can't actually use argument providers. Instead, I've, in, I've created a different kind of concept. And things that produce models of that concept live in this namespace, so conk instead of prof. And so the simplest generator of such types is when ready. And here's an example. You basically give it a future right here. And what it does is, internal to this, it forms a dot then continuation. Just like with the previous example, it will call apply back in the, the previous world. Or if you used like alternative of, it would call visit. So the question was, async forgetful call forms the dot then expression. And the answer is uh, sort of. Yeah, so inside the guts of async forgetful call, um, I could explain the details of how this works. And this is a suboptimal implementation and will not work with every future type that I know you are interested in. But I will explain how, I'll explain a little bit of how this works behind the scenes. So actually, let me see. OK, so this is. I call the result of this a concurrent argument provider. So it's very similar to the argument provider concept, um, except has one additional thing. And I'll come back and explain how this works. So an argument provider works with argo call. Concurrent argument, provi argument provider works with forgetful calls, and, or async forgetful calls and async call. As we said, argo call sort of represents vaguely a some type of potential argument lists. And to be clear, that doesn't mean that it contains like a variant of tuples or something like that. This is like an abstract notion, um, but that's kind of how you should think about it. And the same thing goes over here. A concurrent argument provider is sort of analogous to a future to a some type of argument lists. Or put another way, it's sort of analogous to a future to an argument provider. What was some type? So, so the question was, why some type? And so the reason why it's some type is, what are a couple of the common operations you do at futures? What are, what are some of the operations that, for instance, you've provided? There's when all, and then there's uh, yeah, when, in. when any, right? When any, yeah. So one of the common operations you do with futures is, is a when any operation. So you write when any, and you give it a whole bunch of futures. Yeah. And Whenever one of those becomes ready, the first one that comes ready, or you know, whatever, uh, you could create a concurrent argument provider that sort of does the equivalent of a variant visit, which means that you're getting back a future analogous to something like a future to a variant. And then the argument list that's created um, can be one of any number of a possible set of types. I would argue that any future is a sum type, though, because it could potentially be a value or an exception. Yeah, and, and so the comment was, any future can potentially be a sum type because it could be a value or an exception. And that was, Vittorio brought that up as well. That's kind of how I think about things as well. 
And just like Vittorio, I have completely tried to ignore exceptions for the time being because it's a, a little bit more of a difficult problem. It is. Yeah. Um, but uh, one of the things that I've learned from all of this is because I have these fine-grained facilities for manipulating things like futures, I could actually make many different ways of expanding out futures, maybe some that ignore exceptions, some that have different handlers for exceptions, and some that, uh, you know, that ha you know, have handlers for both or whatever. You, know. you could make all sorts of different fine-grained options without impacting the future type itself, just how they're, they're kind of expanded. So, Vittorio? Mm -hmm. So that was exactly what I was trying to get to when I said this at the moment is not, is not implemented in the optimal way. So it doesn't do that. So if you had multiple when readies in a row, it won't actually use an underlying associated when, out, when all call. Although hypothetically, all of the type information is stored there. This is effectively something like an expression template in the same sense that, that you have expression templates, except I do much less sophisticated stuff than you do in the, in the back end. But I could hypothetically march over all these, and if I had multiple when readies, I could convert it to a single um, when all call. So um, Bryce asked earlier, OK, so what exactly is going on behind the scenes here? And I'll explain it kind of briefly. Um, so as I said, this is the concurrent argument provider concept. Uh, the way this algorithm works is just like, with, uh, just like with call, if you give it something that's not a concurrent argument provider, it passes it along as is. But that's sort of a fib. Uh, what the internals actually do is they, they wrap this in a like as is concurrent argument provider. It's totally like a free. It's just like a struct that contains one member. So it's not actually doing anything complicated here. But the key thing is, the thing that it wraps it in models the concurrent argument provider concept. And by that, I mean you can attach a continuation to it. Uh -huh. And it turns out that this is always like the equivalent of a when ready concurrent argument provider. And when you form the, so what it does is it forms a bunch of dot then continuations. However, the dot, content, dot, the dot then continuations are free for all of the things that are just already ready because statically at, at you know, compile time, you know that this is already ready. It's just a struct that contains yeah. you know, the moved in thing of this stream. Yeah. Okay. So that's also, again, why this isn't technically the most optimal implement implementation. But hypothetically, I could go and change the implementation, group everything that actually is a future of the same type, and, um, and form them into when all calls. So, but uh, I do not do that right now. What I'm asking is, is this the equivalent of uh, writing when all stream future dot then print, um, print on this exact It is equivalent but not equal to. So it does not actually, it does not call when all, it, but it gets the same semantics by chaining dot then. Right, and that's because you, you can implement that more efficiently behind the scene, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, hopefully eventually I can, I can you know, do the sophisticated, convert it to a when all, but. Have you thought about um, making the kind of when ready optional, just have it implicit? So the comment was, have I thought about making this part optional? So in other words, anytime you pass a future, yeah. it just automatically interrupts it. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go back like a long, long time ago. So before Argo, uh, this whole library is actually based on my own implementation of Visit back when Boost first got Variant in. And Boost, when Boost first got Variant in, it had Apply Visitor. And I got very frustrated with how cumbersome it was back then. And if you, could, if you know how cumbersome it was today, uh, uh, because we had lambdas, it was way worse back then with apply visitor and boost because we didn't have language level lambdas, right. let alone you know. And even after eleven, we didn't get generic lambdas until later. Right. Uh, and so I made a whole bunch of utilities for making a slightly simpler version of visit. And so um, you saw how I have the overloaded plus operator. I did that back like ten years ago in my visit implementation. However, before I did the plus operator. I did it implicit, just like what you were talking about. And the problem is, when you do it implicit, you run into problems in both generic and non-generic code when you want to pass along the thing unmodified. So in the, in the visit case, there are, there are some occasions where you want to actually perfect forward a variance along without expanding it, because maybe you're perfect forwarding it along to some other function object that, in turn, has to expand it. But then you could have a protect. Right. And so rather than getting a protect style thing, like boost protect, which 
was a part of Boost Lambda, uh, or Boost Boost Bind or Boost yeah Boost Lambda I guess. Uh, I, think I did get. It's part of Boost Bind. Boost Lambda has its own protect. <laughs> so, clarification: it was part of Boost Bind, um, but Boost Lambda has its own protect. So, to avoid doing that, I just made the expansions explicit. And I and now that I've moved to Argo, I kind of like the you have to be explicit thing because if I did it implicitly, it kind of goes against that principle of call is exactly the same thing as invoke, except for when you you know add these special modifiers. So you should unless you see those special modifiers, you know that you're perfect forwarding those things along, unless somebody happened to perfect forward you something that was already an argument provider. And, uh, so, sorry, you're from Wakanda. Exactly. I'm wondering what you know, when you choose the, the prefix pluses. Yeah. Um, that's uh, really nice because you can pick the layer, the number of layers you want, oh. right? Um, I'm wondering if you have um, if you have in mind that if you were to get this as a language feature and you did the the expansion with the, the um, ellipses, you would chain like you know if you have two or three. Well, if you <laughs> yeah, have yeah, yeah. Ellipses, you, you can't tell them that. Yeah. So the comment from Zach was, if I wanted to do this as a language feature, for instance, if I were over overloading dot dot dot. Which, I'm, to be clear, I'm not sure that that's what we would want to do. And part of it is specifically for this reason. If you want to do a bunch of expansions n levels deep, are you going to have, what, like 12 dots in a row or something? That's totally unmanageable. But there, there, are also other, there are also other problems with that. Um, I think you run into ambiguities when you have dependent types. Uh, if you're inside of a template that's variadic and then you're doing dot, dot, dots, you can run into situations where it's ambiguous where whether you want to expand out an individual thing or the overall thing. So there, there are all sorts of little subtleties. So even though I want it as a language feature, um, it probably would not be done that way. Um, uh, Richard Smith, I know, has been thinking about something kind of similar to uh, overloading dot, 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 except he's been talking about doing it as a prefix operator. And so the idea is, let's say you had a tuple. You can overload a prefix dot, 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 and what that does in the language is it actually converts it to a variadic argument pack that you can then expand with dot, 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 postfix. So that might be more like what we want. But even there, I'm hesitant to keep using dots because it's uh, so, so bad precedent. Dots before and have 12 after. Yes, so you could have 12 dots before and 12 dots after. So it's, I, I, don't, I don't know exactly where we want to take it. But. I mean, you can break out of the, uh, the basic character set. <laughs> Can we use the Can we? Oh, yeah, because that's not confusing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have uh, somewhat different kind of question. Mm -hmm. So, uh, could you imagine any use case for this uh, async forgetful call in uh, like a real production code? So, the comment was can I find any use case for async forgetful call in real production code? And the answer is any place that you're doing concurrent operations and you need to queue up uh, continuations. So it's the same use cases as you know, any other type of thing you'd be doing with futures. If you don't like futures, then you probably would not <laughs> want to use this facility. But. So, uh, uh, OK, but uh, you, you can imagine if you do this like once, but if you like have a chain of these calls, mm -hmm. so how can, would, would you can imagine uh, the chain of it, the uh, graph of uh, calling. So you have like one sync call with a bunch of features, where you can uh, have a call with another bunch of features, so and so on. And uh, how to maintain this kind of code? <laughs> like, yeah. So the question was, if you keep doing this, you get a bunch of futures, and you get you know you have to combine a bunch of futures. How do you maintain this type of code? And that is one of my concerns. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I started with this library in the sense that, yeah, that still kind of happens. But I think it was much worse when you had to form chains manually. I don't know. It's kind of a subjective thing. but So when you can build up um, these uh, graphs of, uh, of execution, um, and then later you use them, um, it's a very powerful technique gives you a lot of opportunity mm -hmm. to optimize those graphs. Um, if you're familiar with HPX, um, it has a similar primitive. Um, we recently uh, announced a similar feature for uh, the CUDA um, parallel programming environment. Um, I, I think, yes, asynchronous programming is difficult, but there's, there's a lot of value in, in yeah. that uh, roadmap's gotten you. Right. 
And uh, another thing on that note, you mentioned like forming the asynchronous graphs and then yeah. re-executing them, yeah. which is very similar to what Vittorio was talking about. And I am really, really interested in that kind of progress. I have enough information here that I could be able to do something like that, but I haven't even attempted that yet. But hypothetically, I think I could probably use similar kinds of constructs and do something similar. And I hope in the long run I can do that. But. Yeah, and that's, yeah. So Vittorio's comment was he could see it being an interface to building what his type is. And yeah, that's exactly how I think I would eventually approach it if I were to actually get around with it. And yeah, I watched your, your talk prior to this conference online, and that was exactly, I was like, oh man, I want to do exactly this. And I was like, I'm going to, I, I didn't have enough time to do that before here, but I, I have no idea how long it would take. But, but yeah, I think that's an awesome direction. Um, TensorFlow is an application that is built on this model. Of, yeah, of building up the, you mean creating the, 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 the graphs and then executing, yeah. Yeah, so the comment was TensorFlow, just so things like this. Just, uh, maybe just another solution is coroutines. So, yeah. The comment was maybe another solution is coroutines. And yeah, th there's, there is some overlap between this and coroutines. And certainly you can kind of think of a when ready as almost like, uh, what is it, co- uh, uh, co right? Yeah, co-await. Yeah. The difference is that here we're kind of staying in the future world and we're not like jumping out of the execution of the function. And there's doing this also doesn't imply creation of threads or anything like that. It's a little it, there's some overlap, but it's not quite the same thing. But yeah, you could you could use coroutines for some of this stuff. Okay, I think I went through this slide already. So as we had the plus operator, which was the DWIW operator. I also introduced the C DWI operator, which is just the concurrent do what I want operator. And instead of overloading plus, I overload the tilde, which is actually a little bit more sane because there's no double tilde. <laughs> so it really is only one operator that's overloaded here. And so just like before, how you can use plus to expand a tuple, you can use a tilde to expand a future. So this is basically the same as pre previous few slides, but a little bit more concise. So we kind of already talked about this, but expanding many futures in a row is sort of like a when all. It's not a single call to when all currently, but it could be. So here's an example. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting here is uh, I use two different future types. So just like I said, uh, the, I have a tuple-like concept. I also have a future-like concept. I actually have a suite of future-like concepts because unfortunately, these two implementations of futures have kind of different underlying fundamental functionality. And I had to complicate some of the, the concepts in order to, to make them all work. But the point I'm making here is both stlab future and boost future model the concept. So I can use both of them with the tilde operator. So these are two different future kinds. And because of the way that I form the continuation doing chains of that thens, this works. So I don't even, you don't even need like the same kinds of futures. And everything just works. And if you have your own future type, you should hypothetically be able to hook in and just like with the other things, you don't even have to overload this operator. Once you model the concept, that operator works for you. OK, so going back to async call, forget about forgetful async call, or async forgetful call, I mean. Um, the only difference is, at least at the usage site level, is it returns a future to the result of the call. So it's not a fire and forget. Um, a tricky part is Argo itself does not actually provide a general purpose future type. And so if you were to make a call to Argo async call and you just passed in you know, uh, your function object, your executor, and just a bunch of arguments, none of which contain a future, I have no idea what kind of future you want back. Do you want an stlab future? Do you want a boost future, a boost shared future, or one of your own futures? And uh, so I, I need to have some kind of a way to get people to communicate that to the async call function. Uh, another way to think about this is Argo acts sort of like the algorithm header or the utility header as opposed to like the vector header. Its sole purpose is interfacing with these ge this generic notion of futures. So it takes a little bit more work to, to adapt it to get exactly what you want. Um, so here's an example of how you actually use async call, again, because I have no way of knowing what kind of future you want. I have, as an explicit template argument here, uh, an instance of what I call a future packager. And this is just basically 
um, an abstraction over a packaging function, like a, sort of like a package task or something like that. Uh, and I have nested in this namespace stlab. Uh, this is just a, a, um, a type that corresponds to the stlab future packager type, which is provided by stlab. Um, and so all that means is you give it the executor, you give it your function that you want to execute, you give it all your arguments, and what this returns is you know, the package, you know, a call to package of that. So can I uh, make an async call in line in the argument list and say build an async call inside another async call? So the question was, can you have like async call and then inside the argument list async call and with a tilde? Yes, you can do that. Um, there may be, and yeah, it can, you can keep going as far as you want. Uh, there may be more efficient ways to do what you actually are specifying there, though, because the way you're specifying it there, um, you're specifying your executor at each and every level because I, I think there's a more optimal way of getting what you want. But you can do exactly what you specified, which is just, just nest them. But there may be a better way to do that. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about future packager, which was this argument right here. So you can pass anything that models the future packager concept to this uh, as a template argument here. Uh, and all that a future packager is is um, a type with an, with an associated function that takes an executor and an invocable. And when you, in when you call it, it, it spits back out basically a pair of a task and a future. Uh, it replaces the need for a promise type, but it's basically isomorphic to using a promise and a separate future. It, has, it provides all the same functionality overall. Um, and uh, yeah, and so it allows, you to, it allows you to specify exactly what you want out of your async call. The things I provide are packager stlab, which produces stlab future, packager boost future, which produces uh, boost colon colon future, and boost shared future, which produces boost colon colon shared futures, corresponding to the result type of the function. And again, you, when you have this library available, you don't really use the packager very often manually. But if you were to go and do it, this is how you would do it. Um, this is actually a simplified use case for nullary functions. But there's actually a trailing set of parameters here, um, which basically describes the parameter list that goes here. Uh, but there's nothing trailing here, so this works with a, a, a nullary task. And so this is the underlying primitive that the async call library uses in order to generate its future types. So you can also expand tuples and variants, just like you can expand uh, tuples and variants in a regular call. The subtlety here is that you don't want it to do exactly what, what prov unpack tuple, or, or yeah, prov unpack and, and prov alternative of do, because those capture by reference and they perfect forward by reference. But in the concurrent world, that is a really unsafe default. Because if you're running something asynchronously and you capture it by, by reference and then you forward that along, uh, you're just going to have dangling references. So by default, uh, when you use the tilde operator, it, it corresponds to these by value things. And so it'll capture, for instance, the whole tuple by value. And then uh, it will expand it uh, you know, once everything becomes ready. Same thing with alternative of. So yeah, there's an example of that. Uh, it becomes a little bit more interesting. Oh, wait. Oh, I think I took out a slide. But uh, ideally, what I want to do, uh, in practice, lots of, lots of libraries provide when all and when any. And what those produce are futures to like tuples and futures to variants. And um, I'm working on getting it so you can chain a whole bunch of uh, tildes in a row. But that is not in yet. But once we do that, and I don't have to overload two tildes in a row, uh, it should provide like a really easy way to expand out those things in any fashion you want. Use one tilde, you actually get back the variant. Use two, it expands out the variant. So you get a lot of fine, fine grain control. You choose which data you want to ignore by just you know, doing it at the different levels. So yeah. Uh, so we, we have that in HPX, but we're, we're not as clever. It's just called the unwrap and then unwrap two. Ah. Unwrap two is the one that everybody uses because I need to check out. I need to check out HPX more. Does Does HPX also do the implicit unwrapping in different uh, places? Yeah, or, yeah. Yeah. For one API. Yeah. I like everything except for the implicit unwrapping, but yeah. Great minds think alike, right? No. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, so. 
overall benefits of async call, at least as I see it, it's very subjective. Um, whether, whether doing a bare asynchronous invocation or one via continuations, you can use it. Um, the thing I really like about it is it doesn't hide the overall operation that you're trying to do. Because you're not chaining a bunch of thens and capturing data explicitly and doing everything, uh, you actually see, oh, this person wants to call this exact function with these arguments when these things are ready. Nothing's hidden. I think it's, it's much more maintainable, much more readable code. It's easier to test, in my opinion, because you don't have all these nested lambdas. There's, there's kind of fewer moving parts. So you can test the overall function and test its usage in an asynchronous scenario. And the capturing is done properly along the way. So there's less that can go wrong. And again, uh, as I said earlier, I can hypothetically, because of the nature of the interface, I can do all sorts of better optimizations behind the scenes, even though I don't currently. And that all comes from the fact that you're expressing at a much higher level what you want. Rather than saying all of the underlying details, you just say, at a high level, this is what I want. And then the implementation can go and figure out the best way to do it. So that has positive and negatives, because as we see, I don't already do that right now. So there's reasons to avoid it. But eventually, it can be improved, and it will be a reason to use it. So we're, I think we're running out of time. So, But there's not that much left. Future, uh, so. As I mentioned, I have a bunch of um, concepts in the library. And if you want to work with the library, you can model these concepts as well. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about how I came to find these concepts, how I discovered them. They're not just, they didn't, I didn't just like pick them out of a hat and then say, yeah, these are the, the operations I want. So um, the core concepts in this part of the library are the executor concept, which I already talked about. Uh, and then there's the future concept. There's actually a suite of future concepts. Uh, that I won't go into, but you can think about it as one. There's the future packager concept, and there's the concurrent argument provider concept. Um, the main thing that I'm going to mention is the executor concept. Uh, uh, it is very minimal compared to uh, what the executors TS and the networking TS think of as executors, and those kind of scare me. And it could be due to my own ignorance because it's not my field, but uh, I derived this specific kind of executor um, from exactly the needs of this library. And it ended up just being a very, very minimal thing. Um, I'm trying to get more involved um, on the SG-1 side of things, just so I can understand exactly all of the rationales. And I know for a fact that I'm missing some of the details for why things have to be so complicated. But uh, yeah, that is why these executors are very simple. The reason, the, the, this will sound so, the reason for the complexity in the proposal is to make it easy to write, to, to write executors, people write executors. So the comment was, the reason why the executor's proposal is so complicated is so that way it's easy for people to write executors. OK. <laughs> I'm not sure I fully understand that rationale, but OK. <laughs> OK. And um, uh, as I mentioned, there's, um, there's some additional complexity. Boost Future and STLAB Futures are kind of fundamentally different in, in some of the operations they provide. And so I had to make kind of finer grain concepts Sort of in the same way that the executors, I guess, you know, I, I, in order to make an efficient model of things, I kind of made these finer grained things, and then it's built up from there. The, the future concepts paper we have, yeah. one year chain of three con, uh, yeah. concepts. Yeah, and I and I kind of go along those similar kinds of lines. Uh, it's it, it it is more complicated than it needs to be, but I'm I guess I'm hoping in the end it can be simplified, but you yeah. know. So yeah, I also have a venable concept, which is separate from the future concept. Uh, because reasons, <laughs> not all futures have a dot then, for instance. Um, and then there's also a forgetful thenable concept. This is something that most or, or none of the none of the futures in the library provide, and I think that's a problem. So another uh, in the libraries that I, I interact with, like STLAB does not have a form of dot then that does not return a future. And so if you do not need a future back, you actually pay for the overhead of that for no reason. Yeah. Uh, and um, the reason why it impacts this library even more is uh, I, I've been building up things like you know conversion. You can, you can make a cast operator between an STLAB future and a, um, and a boost future. And one way you can do this is uh, by using a future packager and a forgetful thenable. And then inside your, your execution operation, you, you package the new future, and then you pull it out, whatever. Uh, but when you do that, if you don't have a forgetful form of then, you're just making an additional future for no reason that just gets thrown away. So I think that there's 
a lower level, uh, a lower level fundamental operation that people just don't implement. So uh, I, I provide that concept in this library, but ultimately, um, and, and I build a lot of things off of that, but ultimately nobody actually provides that just yet. So future direction, suggested direction for the implementation of futures. Uh, I think that a future concept or a suite of concepts is inevitable, which I think Bryce and everybody in SG1 kind of has come to a similar kind of conclusion. There's no such thing as a true vocabulary future type. I mean, you, we can make one, maybe a type erased thing. I, I don't know. but. Uh, I think that um, there are too many different ways to implement futures and different scenarios and interacting with different kinds of hardware that it's just it's not really a feasible goal. Uh, and I don't think that we should be afraid of that. I think in the standards committee, we've kind of fell in love with the term vocabulary type, sometimes for really good reasons. But other times, uh, I think we're sort of forgetting why the, why the standard library is so great. It's because it was generic. You know what I mean? We didn't, there's no vocabulary iterator type. And, and maybe we should start thinking about futures in a similar kind of thing. There's not necessarily a vocabulary future type. Maybe it is generic in the same way that an iterator, that an iterator is generic. So questions? Somebody else has an yeah. <laughs> Vittorio has a comment. Yeah. I feel like this was, S3 bind was Columbus. So I feel like this being a language issue is the right decision. Yes. And I, I really like that comparison. So Vittorio's comment was, this kind of feels like what STD bind was to lambdas. And so this kind of feels like a, a language feature. And that's sort of exactly how I'm, I'm approaching this library is, uh, because C++ is so powerful, I can explore these ideas in the library. But ultimately, the end goal really is just, we want this as a language feature. But I know of no way to play with it until I get there, because I am not a compiler developer. And I think developing this library is probably still much simpler than having gone and tried to figure everything out you know, in the back end, doing, you know, modifying it. So I'm not going to hack on Clang anytime soon, but maybe eventually. So the only thing I don't like about this, I like a lot of this is great, um, is having the explicit syntax for an app versus the implicit. And I, 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 I want to try to convince you that, um, that you want it to be implicit. So okay. we, we in HPX had a explicit syntax for this for many years. Um, and it was terrible. We had to write, like as soon as we started writing real code with it, it gets to be very painful. Mm -hmm. for, if you just imagine a, a uh, Eric's, Eric Niebler's ranges v3, the, the lazy ranges, the, the yep. filter filters, if you imagine a async version of that API, which had these sorts of semantics, um, but which instead of having explicit unwrapping, had implicit unwrapping, you would just be able to take lazy range expressions that you'd written and turn that into an asynchronous call graph without modifying the code at all. Um, so I, I think, while, while I, I get your point about it, that in some cases you might need to pass through, mm -hmm. um, that's not, a, not something that we found to come up a lot. And um, like in the concurrency TSV1, we gave people the option of the pass through. Concurrency TSV1, it gave you a future T to the continuation. Mm -hmm. And we've moved away from that direction because it's sort of horrible. People just want to get the value passed through. And I think it's, it should be the same for arguments that, that, that it should be perfectly fine to have, well, have an argument from an asynchronous API, either be an immediate value or a um, value that's not ready yet. OK, so I'll try to sum up that comment not so poorly described as question. So the comment was, he would really, really like it if, um, if, if the expansions were implicit rather than explicit. Um, and he, he had some compelling reasons. It is ultimately kind of subjective. Uh, I think. I still personally, even hearing those arguments, I still personally prefer being explicit, especially when you're in a template context and you don't know which things are already futures or not. And that's kind of where I have kind of work when I deal with these things. Also, um, I only showed when, uh, you know, when ready. Yep. But as we said, like, there could be other ways to expand out a future, right? Maybe you want when ready and something that, that ignores an exception when it comes through, or you want separate handler for that. So there are different, there are multiple ways that you can expand out a future. And so picking any given one might not even be the one that people want to use anyway. So I, I don't know. I, I may change my mind on it, but um, I'm pretty sure I'm going to stick with being explicit. But I'm not against changing direction. So, And I have no users, so I don't really care if I break users. 
I was wrestling with the same question all the way through the presentation because I was thinking similar thoughts. And mm -hmm. when it comes up that the expand is a single character, mm -hmm. that really does weigh that the syntax overhead is small. And as not the domain expert, but I think as a general library user, not having to worry about does this thing implicitly expand versus these things don't expand so they just pass through. Mm -hmm. Having a single character to make that explicit really did make it much simpler for me as the non-domain expert. So I think this form is certainly going to be most useful for communicating between those who do know the, the, the domain well and those who don't perhaps use this code occasionally. I think it's more ex more convenient with the explicit form for a broader audience. Okay. So uh, to rephrase, Alistair is defending my position, which is <laughs> I'm very grateful for. So um, so I, I also just realized um, I kind of have a question. So you said that you do implicit unpacking. What do you do if you have a future of futures? Do you unpack all the way, or do you just unpack one level? Yeah. Uh, well, f future, future, <laughs> future of futures, uh, future of future already unpacks sort of implicitly. So future of future T already it will automatically unwrap. The one that's truly annoying is the future tuple on future that win win all returns. That one won't natively impact today. Um, I'm trying really hard to kill that. I think that's just a silly type to return from the bundle. <laughs> Um, I would prefer to just return a future of tuple, and if if any of those if, if any of the constituent futures fail, just have a scripted just have an exception type that's descriptive and provides you with that mm -hmm. information. Yeah. So I guess my thoughts there are, when it's explicit, I don't even have to think about this future tuple future thing. How deep things expand because I'm the one that's telling it at each level what to do. So I find that I find that pretty compelling, but. I'm getting some thumbs up. <laughs> uh, I don't know who's next, Tony or uh, the, the non. I guess you know, I haven't played around with the the async case, but the non-async case, I think it's kind of obvious you want syntax there. Mm. Because, yeah, I do pass tuples to functions or whatever. So let's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and then, and then the, the argument would be, well, do you want the async case to be the same, or is there a reason for it to be different? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so his argument was he definitely likes the fact that it's explicit in the tuple in the variant case. Oh, yeah. And um, he can see, but you know, even just out of consistency, that you want to explicit in the other cases, even if you can't come up with you know, a specific reason why. Uh, and I, I agree there. Um, I was going to say something else on that matter, and I, I, I forget. But Zach? Yeah, so um, I want to say, in particular, if I have to teach a new user that this call passes the tuple, and this call that looks exactly like it doesn't, then I have failed as, as a library or language designer. Yeah. Right. Okay. So Zach pointed out, yeah, if, if, if you have two calls that look pretty pretty similar and one of them exp implicitly expands something and the other one doesn't, uh, that's, you know, it speaks to him as sort of like a language or a li library design problem. Could you uh, plan to talk in the future about the efficiency of the mechanism? So it's like when, you know, when there is like a, a way um, is, you know, can it be done in ways that are like uh, non blocking, for example? Mm -hmm. So the comment was can I come back and, and give a, a, a more detailed you know, performance and, and whatever implementation analysis for how this behaves, right? Is that summing it up correctly? Yeah, I, I, I definitely could. Right now, this is really early stages, and I'm actually not a concurrency expert. So, and that's one of the reasons why this is like a high-level thing built on other people's futures. So, I don't have to think about that, but I can go ahead and see, like, you know, what these techniques that I'm using, in addition to existing futures, you know, how that how that behaves. Uh, one thought that comes to mind is you, you could have uh, a implicit API in a separate namespace or in some, some way opt-in. Mm -hmm. uh, Why don't you give Bryce an explicit, <laughs> an explicit implicit tag? Right, yeah. Why don't you name that namespace, namespace Bryce? Mm -hmm. <laughs> How many Bryce fans? Blue wristbands, right? All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Thank you.